whenever I talk to Will. Do, 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 do. You make me feel like we are far away. Do, do, do. You're always in Australia. Do. I'm in a long scootle do. God, it's such a, you know what sucks? Well, more than anything about uh, this record, I was going to save this part for when we talk uh, about the song, Love Song. Mm -hmm. But I want to dive right into this. I can't stand that song. I love it. I know how beautiful it is. I know how great it is. Mm -hmm. But two of my friends that I grew up with, like that when they got married, they were like my high school friends. When they got married, they loved uh, 311. And they did, the, <laughs> they danced at their wedding to the 311 version of that song. <laughs> well, you know why I hate the 311 version of that song is that the 311 <laughs> version of that song made it to number one on the Billboard alternative charts. No. And the Cure version only made it to number two. Yeah, so, I know. <laughs> so whenever 311 runs into Bob Smith, they're just like, sorry. Sorry, sorry dude. Sorry, man. Sorry. I mean, number one, they, man. People are into that Idaho styley, dude. They're into that the Omaha sound, bro. You know what I mean? White reggae, supreme. Right. Should have got rid of the makeup and the big hair and just belted out some 311 stylings. <laughs> Please tell me you're not a fan of 311. No, more offensive to me than 911 as an Australian. <laughs> yeah, dude. That's the perfect answer. I mean, 911, 911 didn't really affect us, but 311 really took over the country. <laughs> Was it big there? Was like, is white reggae big in Australia? Uh, like anything that is big in America, we get, you know, with cultural imperialism, because this is the big trick of America around the world. This is what this podcast is about, isn't it, Josh? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah imperialism. America around the world is cultural imperialism, right? Like America has had Hollywood and movies and television and so much of what the world thinks in relation to culture comes primarily out of America. And that's why as the world changes and like the rise of K-pop and, you know, music from other countries, cultures from other countries infiltrating the mainstream, that's as, you know, America as a superpower, as a cultural superpower is going away a little bit as well. But in Australia, yeah. we're your little buddy because we are a country that is right next to China and uh, we need you guys to <laughs> save our ass when China decide to invade our lovely country. Do they and want so you whatever do. dumb decision you want to sign up for in America, we're in. <laughs> We He's are the it. millhouse to your Bart Simpson. We are the wind beneath your dickhead wings because we need you guys. We are with you. <laughs> You're like, we're slightly stupid. Come on in, mate. Come on in. Any white reggae, revelation, all of them, tribal seeds. <laughs> we'll do a festival here in, in, in Perth. I fucking love it, dude. What level well, then? I, because, you know, this is, this is, we brought you back the fir first time you were here was for, was for LCD Sound System. Yes. Is the cure in that genre of music? Could you feel like you could lump and connect those two bands together? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for a start, eight minute songs, right? Eight minute songs with big intros. Yeah. Like, you know, think songs that could be instrumental tracks in another artist's hands. Like you can imagine a whole bunch of LCD sound system songs could have come out without vocals. And it's the same with these, the cure, particularly in relation to disintegration, right? Like, because most mm -hmm. of these songs have like, two and a half, three minute intros to. Them. Oh yeah. So I can Slowies. see the connection for sure. Like no, it's I... funny though, that you asked me to do this show because like, I don't know if you have like, when you choose the person to come in to talk about the album, like I've listened to the show a lot and it's normally like, I know this person has a connection with this album. I know Jim Jeffries loves the Beatles. So I'm going to get him to come yeah, yeah, in yeah. and talk. And I know that you knew that I love the LCD sound system album, but I don't know how you discovered that I have a connection to this album, Disintegration, or whether this is just a great piece of luck on your behalf. But this is possibly the most important album that has ever been in my life. So yes. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> it was, I've seen The Cure. And by the way, this makes me a filthy casual to Cure fans, to real Cure fans. Yeah. I've seen The Cure at least 35 times, maybe 40 wow. times in my life. Wow. Wow. They wow. were 
the second band I ever saw, but the tour I saw them on, the first time I ever saw The Cure was the Disintegration Tour when it came to Australia. In 89, and, in 89, 90, you saw the, well, holy shit. I think they, I they think came they in like to Australia, I think 91. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're going to take the time, dude. You're a small market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the last concert that I saw live before the pandemic, because I haven't been to a concert since the pandemic, was The Cure at the Sydney Opera House in Sydney, doing disintegration from start to finish. Oh, can we stop for a minute and just thank our booker, Emily? <laughs> can we just take a moment for Emily? I fucking love you. You are a mind reader. Like, we're always talking about bringing you back. And I don't know, I don't know how you suddenly ended up here, but she was like, how about Will Anderson again? I was like, fuck yeah, dude, if he wants to do it, I'd love to sit down. And for you to open up and be like, I've seen the band 48 times. Uh, last con first concert I ever saw, last concert I saw before the world shut down. So Holy I'll tell you, shit. I'll, I'll tell you oh. how I got into this album. If you please, want. please, please oh. take me on that. Take me on that journey because I know what that's like to say that this is the biggest like when I do Radiohead, OK Computer, I can be like, there, no, no record that and Appetite for Destruction changed my life. So this to say it's the most important. I can't wait. Please make this a good story. Don't just be like my sister used to listen to it and I heard it and then it was off to the races. Uh, well, I don't know if I can guarantee that it's a great story, but it is one of the truest, most defining stories of my life. When I was 14, 14 15 years old um growing up in country victoria in australia I, I grew up on a dairy farm 250 people in my local community you know like small place and the only yeah. sort of music that i was ever introduced to was very like there was a, a, all that you would get played like locally is like australian bands like cold chisel jimmy barnes very iconically australian bands paul kelly and then songs that had the word sex in it so like George Michael, Prince, you know, so the girls could have a dance on the dance floor. Sure, that was sure. literally the entire genre of mu music I really knew. The year before, like, like one of my friends. We're losing you. Hold on. We're losing yeah. you. Wait, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. So, yeah, wait, wait. Go I back, said. go back, go back for a second because we lost you for a second. What was the, so you said, uh, and then something, something, a couple, one of my friends, I think was the last thing that you yeah. said. So yeah, a couple of years before, one of my friends had given me like a mixtape of the BC Boys and Run DMC. So I started getting into hip hop a little, but music like The Cure was not on my radar in at all. Anyway, okay. Like yeah. I mean, at that point, they'd already re they'd already released like seven albums or something, right? Like I'm 15 years old. They've they've yeah yeah they've had a huge amount of hits around the world, but I don't think I would have ever heard a Cure song up until that point. So they're not playing it. They're not. I'm 14, they're not playing. Or 15. They're not playing it on the radio at all. Like, doesn't don't you have radio stations yeah. out there? Yeah, we had a radio station. It was called 1242 3TR, Sound of Gippsland in the Valley. And if you ring in right now and say, hello, I listen to Mummery in the morning, you will win $12.42. So <laughs> that was the stakes of the local radio yeah. station. They're not no, playing no, the cure. No, they weren't really belting out the cure, no. <laughs> Moody, goth rock. So... Um, I go to this party when mm -hmm. I when I'm uh, 14, 15 years old. So yeah, I, it's gonna be like 1989. So I'm 15. I'm 15 years old, and there's this girl that I a friend or anything at this point, and there's this girl that I am absolutely in love with. Her name I can still remember to it this day. Her name is Chrissy Rennick, yeah. and uh, Chrissy Rennick loved The Cure. And that night we had this um, Australian TV show that plays on a Saturday night called rage where they'll play like video clips basically but they'll just curate a night so they might have like a a cure special or like a youtube special sure it's your headbangers so ball night, yeah yeah so that night they're having a cure special and i sat up with chrissy rennick all night long like imagine you've never heard the cure before and then you sit down and watch like three hours of like their video clips their songs all in a row it's like some sort of conversion therapy you know, it's like totally. it's like the shit that it's like the churches do to stop people from being gay. <laughs> they they your eyes open through. like Clockwork Orange. You were just like completely <laughs> like. Uh. It's like it had to be an instant goth, like in three oh. hours in the night. That's and so, so funny. I'm like my parents' worst nightmares. This little farm kid goes away to one party and comes back a goth. But that's pretty much what happened. <laughs> so no, you you got it. This is I hilarious.
Got, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I like loved her so much. I decided that I was going to just get into the cure. Like, you know, this is the way that I was going to get my me was that I was going to become, you know, this band, the cure that she liked. So I went out and I bought like on CD, it would have been at that point. I bought Disintegration because that was the album that had just come out. Now, mm-hmm. I've just sat up and watched like them play all their pop songs. You know, this is what this rage is, right? It's like, you know, the four minute edits of video clips that came out as pop songs. Short like, and Disintegration sweet. is not that bad. Like Disintegration is, you know, this, this is Robert Smith, like making a statement about those pop songs, like doing something that's, you know, moody and sprawling. And so can you imagine for this kid who's 15 years old, how hard I had to try to like this music? Because to me, it did not sound like music at all. To me, like, it wasn't like I was sitting there going, this is amazing. I've never heard anything like this Of course, before. you're not blown oh. away. You, you like her and because you like her and she likes them, you love them now. Yeah, it's like it was like smoking. You know how like you have to actually work really hard to become addicted to smoking. Oh yeah, it's horrible at the start. <laughs> like you really have to push through. God, this is gross. I do not like this at all. But I'm gonna keep going because I want to be cool. I feel cool. I, I look cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's <laughs> what I was like with disintegration. Like it became something that I went from not understanding that I was torturing myself trying to understand so that I could. And of course, I mean, can you imagine the themes of this album? You talk about love song and it being played at weddings. Like imagine you're a 15 year old kid, like who, you know, is in love properly for the first time and is listening to the, the lyrics on this album. Like, you know, I mean, I'm glad I was more into love song than I was into pictures of you because I think I would have become a stalker if I was more into pictures of you. <laughs> it always feels a little too every breath you take for me. You're like, yeah, yeah it's very, it's be very a love br- song, but real creepy. Yeah. yeah, dude, it's a little creepy. That's that's so cool, man. So how long did it take you to start to start to actually really like the band and not just like be attracted to them because of the girl? So I think what I decided then to do was go back and listen to all the old albums. And for me, this is what is interesting about The Cure. And I think on a broader scale, like when we talk about our careers and what we do, because yeah. I think there's something about this album, and I certainly don't want to offend Cure fans because I think The Cure are one of the greatest, greatest bands of all time. Absolutely. Yeah. But this is Robert Smith's attempt to make a masterpiece. And I'm not sure that it is a masterpiece, right? Like I think it's close to, and there's a lot of compelling reasons why it it could be considered so and why it's on this list, but I'm not sure it is a masterpiece. And I'm not sure that they've ever made an album that is a complete masterpiece. You know what the masterpiece of Robert Smith's career is? What's that? His career. You you can go to a Cure concert and you'll hear 40 songs you know, and they're all great. Yes. And and I would go a step further. He's managed to write songs that apart from maybe like a, a Friday I'm in love or something like that, they've never been so accessible that they've been played so much that you don't want to hear them again. Like it's rare for a band, like any band in the world, if you've got like those big, big songs, normally one of them just became so ubiquitous that you can't ever like just like, I mean, Yellow by Coldplay is a good song. Like if you heard a new band come along and sing Yellow by Coldplay, you'd be like, man, this is like a really good tune. Yeah, it Whereas is. like, you know, if you hear it now, you're like, I cannot hear this song. Like I've just heard uh, it way too many times. I can never I, hear I, it. Dude, I, I can't get enough of Yellow, bro. I'm, well, I'm, a, like a, I'm a yellow head, dude. <laughs> I am all yellowed out. I love that song. I want to open the jam with it. I, I still can pinpoint the moment I heard it. And I was like, who is this fucking British dude? And I was in. So I guess. I mean, that is kind of the point I'm making, which is that's a great song. And it shouldn't be regarded as a great song because not a great song because people heard it too much. And I think one of the great things about this Disintegration album is the inaccessibility of it. It was super successful. I think their most successful album ever in America. But every song is six to eight minutes long. It wasn't written to be a radio album. Often like... Robert Smith, who is actually a very good singer, like if you've seen him live, often he's not even singing on songs. He's kind of like whispering or mumbling, like of anywhere to dive into the cure, like for a 15 year old kid who had no reference for this, this was the most complicated part to dive in. So then I went back and just found out that they had seven other albums up to that point. And every single one of them has, and this is the cure, right? Like Mm. every single one of those albums has three or four iconic classic songs. 
and then a, at least a couple of other songs that you're like, these are great songs. And then normally I think there's also another couple of songs, but you know. There, there's, but there's nothing on this, even though the songs are long and it's very moody and it's not like, I'm not gonna sit here and say it's not an easy listen. For, for a 42 year old Josh to finally hear this for the first time. I mean, how old were you when you heard this record that, hold, that, that showed up? You're 15. We're way different. You know what I mean? This is my real first attempt <laughs> to like to like jump into the cure. The only other record that I had heard, uh, uh, Adam, you might want to check it for me. We did it. I did it with Margaret Cho. It was, I think, uh, Boys Don't Cry. It was like their early, early shit. So it's way more like post punky and and there's some speedy stuff if I'm if I if I can remember correctly. I didn't go back and listen to it again after starting to dig into this, but. For a 42 year old, this is the cure that I like more than than Friday I'm in love. The the oh, hits are yeah, absolutely. So this is this is Radiohead post OK Computer, right? This is this is Kid A. Is that what you're saying? This is their yeah, Kid A. I think so. Like I mean, but also I just think in a general sense, like what Radiohead did was they went, we have proved that we can be the biggest band in the world. Now that is not the most interesting thing to us to hold on to that. We want to go off and, you know, throw the guitars away and do something different. And I think this was a bit like that with Robert Smith. Well, all right. All right so this is my question, because I don't know. I, dude, I'm nine years old. And I mean, The Cure, maybe I heard some hits when this actually came out. And I remember them being in my musical ecosystem, but not like being like, oh, I love The Cure or ever, ever listening to a record. How big were they? And what were their hits? Adam, check that for me. Like, what were what were the songs and how big were they before this record? Oh, before this record? No, no, huge. Like, I mean, they'd had the, the, the record before, which would have been Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, I think. Like, had had a couple of big worldwide hits that were very poppy. Like, um, you know, Why Can't I Be You and Hot, Hot, Hot. Like, big, full vocal, kind of really upbeat, dancey numbers. But they had had, like, a string of iconic... Like if you love cats probably came out before this, like there was a bunch of like pop songs that they had had like charm okay. all over the place. But in America, this was their big album. Like they were playing stadiums in America. No, no, like, no. This, I found this dude. Know. I found this fact. Will that I, this says for a brief period in 1989, the cure could lay claim to being the biggest band in the world. That year they played a sold out show at Wembley stadium followed by a gig at New York Giants Stadium in front of 44,000. And it says 30,000 tickets had been purchased. And oh my God, 30,000 tickets had been purchased in one day. Uh, and then Smith being the fucking positive dude that he is had to say gloomily. I love how they put that in the sentence. It's like he reflected gloomily. It was never our intention to become as big as this. Like I, I <laughs> gloomy. He's, he's the only, every, every time he says anything, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like uh, Robert Smith uh, recollected melancholy. <laughs> I mean, you would have thought with like Robert Smith, you don't have to feel in those words. You only have to point it out when he's not being, gloomy or melancholic right like if you were yeah, just yeah, like yeah. reply jauntily oh okay well thanks for <laughs> pointing that out i didn't <laughs> so i mean so there i mean 89 is when this record came out and so if i don't think before this in america you know they were big enough to play that stadium so obviously this the, them playing new york giant stadium was after this record came out yeah. um it's like, I would love to hear, oh God, I wish I would have, that's something I should have done. And I apologize for, I should have listened to that first record again. So I really could have seen the contrast in this, but I'm not going to lie to you, Will. I, it's weird how I wasn't feeling this at first. And then I had sex to it and it changed everything. This record went from being like, all right, this is pretty good. I mean, love song, that, that shit rules. And there's, you know, pictures of me or pictures of you. And then, and then I, I fucking did, did the skadoodle with this song, did this record playing in the background. <laughs> Cause usually I listen to massive attack or Portishead. Yeah. Usually I'm always, I've got my trip hop. I'm good with that. I mix TV in the TV on the radio into the mix a little bit. Um, a little okay. weird, but you know, I'm trying to show her yeah. that I got range. And and so then I put this record on and and let me tell you, it just it, it really made me like fall in love with this album. It's a very sexy album. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, absolutely. There's no doubt about the fact that, like, I mean, Robert Smith writes 15-year-old boy songs. It doesn't surprise me that I fell in love with, like, not in a Good musical sense. I mean, the musicality of what he does is very complex and adult in many ways, but the lyrical nature and the subjects that he's fascinated about writing about are always sort of like teenage crush style love songs, yearning after somebody that you can't get or telling somebody you love how much you love them and but being haunted by, you know, darkness all around. It's very teenage, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, God, I wonder how I would have thought of this listening to it at 15. Because it was like all I knew. I just, I think by that point, I, I knew... <sighs> Fuck, man. I know. Obviously, they must have been played in on the radio. I feel like they they were big enough. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out how they suddenly went from just being this British band that like had a couple songs and were like, you know, were they goth right from the beginning? Yeah, they, I mean, the whole image of goth, a lot of it's based on them, right? This is yeah. one of the things about the Cure. Also, is you're talking about a band that has had like has experimented with these styles of songs they have done over the years. And yet, of course, because of their sound and their look, they've always sounded iconically like The Cure as well. Like, I think that's really interesting. How much internally from album to album and song to song, the songs can be incredibly different, but they always still sound like The Cure. And if you see that image, that iconic image of like Robert Smith with that big hair and that sort of those black clothes and like that guitar, you know, that boys don't cry image from when you would have seen yeah. that album. Like I remember, oh man, talk about embarrassing teen things to do. Please, I drew, I drew by hand that cover image of the black and white silhouette of Robert Smith, drew it by hand and then wrote the lyrics to boys don't cry on the back of it and gave it to Chrissy Rennick as a present. I can't believe we never got together because I seem like a real cool teen guy. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on for a second. You and Chrissy never got together? Never, no. I stayed with the band. I formed a lifelong relationship with the band, The Cure, but we never, nothing ever happened. This no. absolute dedication of my life resulted in nothing. What? But can I, can I now I want to get to the bottom of this. Fuck The Cure. Did, did you have a moment? Because I've done this before where I've had a girl like, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years old. She, we went out to dinner. She's still at my house at three in the morning in my parents' basement on the couch. I haven't made a move. We're watching some shitty movies. She's waiting for it. And I pussied out and I didn't. And I still think of that to this day. That happened a couple times. Is that one of those situations for you? I mean, you'd think it would be, but no, I didn't even get there. I didn't oh. even get to be B-Rabbit in the <laughs> bathrooms before with his mum's spaghetti on his jacket, wondering if he was going to fuck it up. That wasn't me. I didn't even oh. get into the club. They rejected me at the door. But what a great reconcil... What a great... Was it reconciliation prize or whatever the word I'm looking for? Sorry, I'm uh, still... Yeah, but no, I, I I do agree with you. Like this lifelong love, love of this band is absolutely, it, it was, I mean, what else could you get out of a teenage relationship than like a band that you've, you know, gone and seen all over the world for the rest of your life? So I I'm mean, happy. Do you, do you think if they're in that situation, if you never are with Chrissy and she's watching those videos with you and let's say you never see that, do you think you'd still find this record to be as important? I mean, obviously, do you think you would have found this band is what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think so. Although it's it's really hard for me to know because we started talking about LCD sound system, right? I do think that my love of The Cure really opened up my mind to like a whole world other of music. other music. So yeah. I don't know, maybe not. Like I was going to say, of course I would because all the other bands I like, of course you'd eventually come to The Cure, but maybe all the other bands I like, I like because, I mean, I think I love Radiohead so much because I like The Cure in the first place, right? And many of the things that I admire about those bands are the fact that, you know, like Radiohead always sounds like Radiohead, but one Radiohead album doesn't necessarily sound like another Radiohead album. And uh, I think that that is very much what I think about when I listen to The Cure as well. Well, so, so, so where did they go after this? Like, how did their music change after this? Did they stay in that? Because reading some of the facts, just for the, I just want to do a little, just so we can yeah. get this out of the way, the background. So people don't know if you've never listened to it for the first time. This is the eighth studio record by the group released in May in 89. This was a return to the goth rock sound from their earlier in the decade. Uh, the main inspiration for this album, I, I read this, I found this could be, 
I don't know if 30 is the, the, the age that you really start going through this kind of like midlife crisis, but supposedly everybody, this record is, is inspired by the fact that Robert Smith was about to turn 30, 30. Yeah. It's so it's, young. <laughs> uh, which makes uh, disintegration the equivalent of Bo Burnham's inside. Yeah, yeah, most, yeah, yeah. This is the most projects about having a meltdown <laughs> as you're about to turn 30. Oh, hush, you boys. Um, <laughs> basically, he felt the pressure of having to follow up the band's previous successes with something deeper and better. Uh, he felt all the masterpieces in rock and roll had been completed well before ba the band members reached that age. Um, yeah, a lot of the, I mean, I hate to say that's true, but it, I feel like the, the real prodigies dropped that record at like 23, 24. So to get to 30, yeah, it's kind of like, that's what's so funny about comedy. It's you're like, if somebody says they're 22. You're like, all right, bro, chill the fuck out. You're like, you're not going to get anywhere until you're at least 44, bro. When you get to 44, <laughs> that's when the real money comes in. Uh, you um, know what I find interesting about that though, is that I what? think it's a mistaken, um, way to look at things. Like I often think if you write a masterpiece at 22 or 23, or if you're like Eddie Murphy and you make like, you know, raw and delirious at like, you know, 18 and 20 or whatever he was when he did that. Yeah. Like I reckon if Eddie hadn't made two huge things at 18 and 20, we'd still see Eddie making specials now. Like, I think it was because like, sometimes if you make, Faulty Towers as your first project for the yeah. rest of your life, you got to go, how do I follow up Faulty Towers? You know? Yeah. And, and I think that like Robert Smith, the reason that he's still making incredible music and like I, but you know, it was only a few years ago that I went and saw the cure and they're still playing two, three hour shows and like just incredible shows is because he didn't write his masterpiece at 22 or 23. Really? So you feel like he he has I'm not going to say it's a chip on his shoulder, but it's kind of like he's like that basketball player that's still even on a shitty team, but still dropping 25 points because they're just like, right. fuck you, yeah. dad. <laughs> <laughs> just fucking angry all the time because that's why I got a fucking score. Um, <laughs> you know, I I, I, I there's a I look, I, I'll be completely honest. I, I've never looked at the cure as like in part of my French pussy rock. I always thought something to be very cool about this band. I mean, anytime a band comes out and their look is imitated, like Madonna, you know, um, Criss Cross, fucking, I don't know if that happened in Australia, but when Criss Cross dropped, you know, the jump, jump, Daddy Mac will make you. When they came out, people started in my elementary school or middle school started wearing clothes backwards. And it's just, they do something so iconic. And I, I kind of think the look of, of, uh, of Robert Smith is is just as big as the the music right i mean it's iconic yeah and yeah like i mean i remember going to that disintegration tour again as a kid who'd never really been around that culture i'm in the big city you know um surrounded like everyone in the audience looked like they'd come dressed in case someone had to drop out of the cure that night and they had to fill in. That's what it looked like. Like everybody was ready. I'm ready. To be in ready. I heard Robert got a high ankle sprain. I'm ready to go. Right. I'm ready to go whenever. Yeah. Hilarious. It felt like one of those, you know, press conferences in North Korea where Kim Jong-un has all these bodyguards, <laughs> yeah. you know, all these lookalikes. That's basically what it was like at this gig. And as a kid from the country, it was like walking into the star Wars cantina. You're like, what is this? Like, you know, yeah. all these people just, worshiping this culture dress like the band like enjoying the music like the band yeah it was it completely it, not invented because there were other people and other bands around at the time but i think that when people think of that era and they think of that look you know you can immediately go that's the cure so all right so my question now is how does that how does that go off with you in a small town like victoria because did you start dressing like this yeah, absolutely. I mean, not the full like makeup and, but I did, I did a period of time where I was like wearing nail polish. I still to this day on stage wear like all black and like my, put my hair up big, not like Robert Smith big, but sure. like it's still, it is kind <laughs> of that look, you know, you got like a little wet. doodad <laughs> hanging over your eye. You're like, hold on. I got, I got a big show at JFL Northwest. Let me get my lipstick and let me smear that. And I'm ready for the special I thing. Okay, so I'll tell you a funny story. Um, Please. The, the Cure were touring <laughs> Australia and I was working at a radio station and um, uh, Robert Smith was going to come in and like do this sort of two-hour conversation, you know, in-depth conversation with this very respected music guy who worked at the station. But he knew yeah. how much I loved The Cure. 
And he said, like, Robert's asked for it to be on the weekend when there's no one else here because he just wants to come in and privately do it. But if you happen to be here, maybe you could, like, you know, come and say hello. And, like, because he knew how much friend. I loved him. It's a so, good friend. So he said, just pretend you're working in your office. And if there's an opportunity, I'll, I'll just introduce you. And so that happened very, very briefly. But my favorite thing about it was because Bob was doing radio and because there was no one else there. And it wasn't one of these things, you know, it was back in the day where you don't capture pictures or anything. So yeah. he's come in in his casual clothes, right? Like for the interview. What does that and look so, like? Wait, what does that look like? Right. Lululemon? <laughs> okay. Well, Josh. <laughs> it's funny that you guess that because <laughs> what do you think if if Robert Smith's going in for an interview, what do you think he goes dressed at? It's like if you just had to speculate on what, uh, how much makeup does he do, how much does he do his hair, what does he wear? <sighs> for it's radio. This isn't yeah. television. No radio. I mean, I just know how I go in when I have to do voiceover work. Like, I look like butt cheeks, dude. Like, I do not. I'm not putting out my best self. Probably didn't shower. Uh, you know, I'll wear jeans at least and a t-shirt. I hate, but Robert Smith, he's a different entity. It's like he's yeah. on the level of slash, where if you don't see him wearing a leather's pant and a fucking top hat, it's gonna feel weird. Right. Um, I would say well, you got excited <laughs> about Lululemon, so it might means I'm on the fucking I'm on the I'm, I'm getting warmer. Yeah, I I fuck, I think dude is wearing like Fuck. Okay. I feel like dudes wearing like, like really flowy, you know, kind of, uh, not kimono pants, you know, maybe a full kimono. I could see him dressing like Brian Eno and like having full kimono and just, you know, <laughs> hair undone, uh, light, light rouge. I don't know anything about makeup. Maybe some, <laughs> maybe some like fucking eye shit. You know, to fucking maybe like the Batman dark circles just because that's how he wants to look. Um, am I close? Yeah, you are actually not too bad, to be okay, honest. Okay, so take me there. <laughs> you, makeup and hair, you're almost absolutely nailed. He had okay. put some on, but the bare minimum. Like that thing where he could have gone with none, but he's just like a smear of lipstick, a little bit around the eyes. <laughs> that'll do, right? Like ruffled their hair up a bit, but not like full, like, like. Yeah, just yeah, like, you didn't, you didn't spend do. time on still, it. Yeah. You're big, but I'm not big, big. No hairspray, just whatever sure. it is. He okay. puts, he probably puts, he probably put some mousse in and just like crunched yeah. it up a little bit. <laughs> I do that. I know what that's yeah. like, dude. <laughs> it's like the headphones are going to dampen it down anyway. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's like it's pointless. Too much. <laughs> so then he's wearing a white sort of floppy, very floppy long t-shirt. You know, one of those t-shirts that sort of is more like a woman could wear as like a, you know, a, a, a t-shirt dress. Style. Like a sleep. Like, oh uh, yeah. Oh, a t-shirt dress. I was going to say like a, like a nightgown sleep sleep. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That sort of vibe. Right. Yeah, but yeah. then this is the bit that I remember. <laughs> he is wearing the tightest pair of Lycra bike pants, <laughs> <laughs> black Lycra knee length bike pants. That is like, oh and it was just like, what is this? What is this outfit? Are you going to a sleepover? I don't understand. <laughs> and he's pale. The guy gets no sun, so his fucking calves are probably just just nothing. Yeah, and I can't weird imagine hair. He's riding a bike anywhere, right? Like you know. No, Jesus Christ! So what? So what was it like? You got to you got. I know you didn't get yeah, the picture, I, but did you get to meet him. I know, but I did get to meet him. I got to say hello. I just got to. I mean, I got to do what I always think those moments are less about the other person and they're more about you, right? Like so. Yeah you should always remember in those moments that you don't need the other person to be excited to meet you. That moment is very much about you as a fan being able to say, Hey, you know, your music has been really important to me and I think you're amazing and thank you very much. And then just go like, you know, that's all that interaction needs to be. And that's all that interaction was, you know? Yeah. You know, what's funny is I had the exact opposite with somebody that's on that legend status and important to you Beck is that important to me? He was, mm. I, I've kind of, I'm not really, I, it's weird. I, I don't listen to him that often anymore, but when I do, if I fall right into it, it's like, I still love his music yep. and he was so influential and never got to meet him until um, I was at a date in Hollywood uh, on Franklin and Bronson at this like little cafe outside. And, and lo and behold, here comes Beck walking with his wife and her kids. 
and I just stop the date and I'm like, hold on for a second. And dude, I get such horrible verbal diarrhea. Like, I'm just like, oh my God, I'm such a huge fan. I saw you at, at Rio in Santa Cruz and you did, that was a really small show where you only had about 600 pounds. It's like, blah, 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 blah. and I'm just like, and then I asked for a picture and he's just like, I'm with the kids. I just, I'm like, yeah. And I immediately realized I fucked it up. I was like, fuck yeah. I did this whole thing wrong. <laughs> Everything. But I, I think I'm remembering this story right. And I, I hope that I am because otherwise, like, this is a dumb story to tell. But I think I am remembering this story right. So I know that at least this part of the story is true, that mm-hmm. I was at Coachella many years ago, like a whole bunch of years ago. like, And um, I was sitting on the hill and we were sitting, Beck was sitting in front of us watching a band and I am almost certain that that band was the cure. So this is the weirdest full circle thing of you saying that about Beck. He literally sat in front of us on the grass. Let's take another, let's take another moment to <laughs> uh, point and shout out to Emily, the booker. <laughs> she did a no look pass. She just was like, <laughs> and just threaded the needle right to me under the fucking bat. <laughs> fucking dunked it easy. Right. Hang on. This is I'm I'm starting to believe in conspiracy theories. <laughs> this is like the new QAnon. I swear to God, dude. <laughs> we just wanted you on. We were like, yeah, hey, dude, we'll make it fun regardless. And you're like, no record has ever done more for me <laughs> in my existence. That's good. That's so cool, though, man. It's it's cool when you find like life changing record. Do you have any other life changing records that like kind of, you know? Like anything else that really just kind of set your course. Do you know what I mean? Like like Radiohead, yeah. Guns N' Roses, Stone Temple Radiohead. Pilots. Radiohead. Yeah. Radiohead for sure. Run the Jewels 3, I think, like of a modern album. Because I thought that I was at that point where I wasn't going to ever like have a modern modern album really blow my mind again. And that that one to me like was just like, oh, wow, because I love old school hip hop. Like that was normally like my real sort of area. I mean, not even that old school, old school, like late 90s, early 2000s hip hop. That's like my real period that I love. And then like Run the Jewels came along and RTJ3, the third album. Like I'd got into them a bit before, but that third album just like blew my mind. Um, But yeah, The Cure, um, Arcade Fires, The Suburbs, like is, is like one of those albums for me. I just... I'd really loved their stuff up until then. And I didn't really expect that they were didn't get to come up with something that I thought that I loved even more than wow. Yeah. What yeah. had come before. I remember like that dude, album. Dude, when when I re- I was doing a show in San Diego and I was driving my friend Benji Aflalo's car. Uh, we did a show and I'm driving his I guess it's his or his parents, like he's very wealthy. So he has like a nice BMW with like Sirius XM in it. And he falls asleep on the ride back from San Diego to LA and I'm listening to some cool station on Sirius. And they were they played uh, the suburbs for the first time that that first song, and I went home and found it on YouTube, and I probably listened to it seventy five times that night. It was so great. But that's that's all right. So here's a good question then, because like in a sense, Arcade Fire, they 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 don't exist. I can hear a lot of them in this record, right? You know, like. The, the long intros, the moodiness, I mean, they create a fucking vibe. Like, who is taking the the torch from the Clash, not the Clash, what, what the band we talk, the Cure, and, and running with it right now? Like, who are the bands that you see the most influence? Because I feel like you know music from being in, in you know, in pop culture and in the world and shit. I know, but it's, it's interesting, because I was actually thinking about this recently. I think that one of the more interesting things about the Cure to me is that I think that most bands would like rate The Cure. Like if you talk to most big bands or like most, you know, I, I just think that they're one of those bands that like a lot of people would be like, yeah, we were influenced by The Cure. But can you see bands that are directly influenced by The Cure where you go, oh yeah, they're clearly trying to do what The Cure does? I actually don't think you do. And I think the interesting thing about that is I think The Cure just nailed it, right? So why would you bother going into that lane to try to do the same thing the cure is doing because you now you're you right you're it's right a- i don't I, I don't think of anybody that that is doing the exact kind of sound that they're doing with the mm. with the look 
to the to the lyric stuff and to the sound. Yes, there's stuff that people sing stuff about, like you said, about like writing for the perspective of a 15 year old kid. There's other artists that do that. There's other artists that do very moody, sad music, but to all combine it, it's almost like a cool Voltron. Like every little piece of this pure puzzle is what makes them iconic and cool that nobody else has done. Yeah, I mean, I think some of those modern like I think you can hear the influence in some of those like modern emo sort of yeah. pop bands, like, you know, definitely like, you know, and the big sort of stuff that they're trying to do. That's not really my style of music, but I can see the influence there. But what I think they did was they went, we've done with this. You can take what you want to do because like the thing I liked about the cure as well is we think of them as being moody music. Like when I think of like black, black rebel motorcycle club or something like that, I love like them. That's, love them. That's like moody music to me um i don't know if i told you this story last time but if if, if i didn't uh, hopefully i didn't so you i didn't <laughs> had met a uh, black 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 uh, rebel motorcycle club um through the radio station i'd seen them do a few concerts really loved them i was doing a gig at a, ca a casino so like on the border in australia like imagine any casino in the world where you're doing a comedy gig yeah that that's basically what this is right okay, so yeah yeah um black rebel motorcycle club have been playing a gig in town they've come down to the casino afterwards because it's the only place open where they can get a drink i go downstairs i see the guys from black rebel motorcycle club and i'm like hey guys you know have a bit of a chat yes had the gig blah 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 you know and they say hey man you wouldn't mind if you could get us any weed would you and i'm like oh well this is convenient the dude who runs this gig is always telling me whatever you need mate you just ask me I got whatever, you, yeah. like, whatever okay. you need i love that guy i love that guy <laughs> whatever you need mate <laughs> and so i'm like okay fantastic uh, so i go over to this guy and i'm like hey man um is there any chance you you could get us some weed and he looks around the room walks up to the guys from black rebel motorcycle club and goes hey guys you don't know where we could get some weed, do you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. He's I got mean, the they connection. Did look like guys yeah, yeah, weed, yeah. So. Oh, that's hilarious. Great. How that, big was how big was Black Rebel Motorcycle Club in Australia? Yeah, that would be. They they had a really good uh, the radio station I worked at Triple J is an alternative music station. It's very big in Australia. And um uh Black Rebel Motorcycle Club or a big band like on that's for, for ages played festivals in Australia. one of yeah. one of one of my favorite bands like arguably like I, I when i got into them i got into them hard i love everything about their sound i you know bringing it back to the cure i can hear a lot the, the moodiness i mean there mm. there's definitely and also one of the dudes from black Rebel motorcycle club came from um uh brian jonestown massacre mm. which a hundred percent i can hear it's it's i feel like you, i could say this about any band i could say it about the deftones there's so many bands that i could be like if the cure were that big in the world then 100 percent that made nine inch nails for sure adam good yeah. pluck yeah um, uh, you know what that's actually a very good point because i think that like nine inch nails who i love i reckon they formed around sort of 1989 i reckon it is literally around the area the era that like disintegration comes out so you imagine like a young Trent Reznor who's like loving that sort of music, obviously loves that sort of look. You could see it. I mean, it took it to a harder aesthetic, obviously with what a lot of the Nine Inch Nails stuff is, but also very much that aesthetic of like a lot of love songs, a lot of really fragile, dark, like beautiful love songs set to music that is actually much more moody and atmospheric. So you can definitely see it. For sure. Yeah, I, and I also, and, and the Pretty Hate Machine, he wrote, Adam found us, a Pretty Hate Machine came out in 1989. So that's that's their right. first record. Their next one's Wish. Um, you know, Trent Reznor hears this while he's making Pretty Hate Machine. Maybe he's like, go a little darker, but he definitely got to the moody shit when he got to Downward Spiral. Downward Spiral. And then even the fucking The Fred, dude, fucking the Fragile. Yeah, dude. But he that was opiates. That was when he was doing the, <laughs> doing the fucking painkillers. That was that was when me and him would have been buddies. Well, I um, think that Robert Smith was doing a lot of psychedelics. LSD. Yeah, a lot of LSD. Yeah. That's And that explains the, you know, the maggot brain style long intro before every song. It, it, it does kind of come together like, you know, in this weird 
I don't want to call it emo, post-punk emo, you know, bitches brew. It's like noises and synths, and then it all comes together. And then he finally, it's always funny. Anytime he starts singing in this record, like a tw- somebody does one of those, like, those twinkler things. There's like, bring like, <laughs> this buzz is of you, and then your love is so true. <laughs> Bring it, drop it. <laughs> That's like his. It's like his kick it. Bring. <laughs> this is a great record, man. I love that. This is your favorite record, dude. I fucking love that. Yeah. Well, probably not. Like, I mean, probably not my favorite record, but I think to me the most influential album that you know, because it, it changed everything for me. You know, it blew my mm-hmm. mind. It opened up my mind, and I do think that I wouldn't like the sort of music that I do like probably because if I hadn't. And revisiting it, like when we went and saw them in 2019 at the Sydney Opera House. So they did um, disintegration from start to finish, as a lot of you know bands do these days. But what Love they that. actually did, because I mean, of course, they're the cure. They did like 40 minutes of the B-sides first. So they played all the B-sides first for 40 minutes and then they had a break. And then they came, did disintegration from start to finish. And then they did some like hits at the end just for you know for fun. Just for but, shits and giggles. Yeah, to get everybody. All right. What yeah. was, since you've seen them 35 times, what was the best show? Oh, okay. Here's what I would say. And like, you know, 35 is like nothing compared to, I remember I saw them at the Hollywood bowl on their last tour. And I remember talking to somebody who was going to see all 80 gigs on that tour. Like they were literally going to follow them around and see every show. And the reason you can do that with the cure is often when they're touring. So we became friendly with Roger, the keyboardist from the cure. And um, he was telling us that on their set list, they would have about, 85 songs for a tour so each night they're playing 35 to 40 songs and they've got 85 songs on their set list so from night to night they will just like do completely different shows so i love the thing that i really love is if you get to see them say four or five times in like in a week in different places because then guaranteed you like you've seen one where they've like i mean i I remember seeing them at that hollywood bowl show and then i saw them at a festival set in australia so they were just playing like 90 minutes of like hits you know just like bangers festival like hits and then i went saw them at sydney entertainment center the next night and like the first two hours was like you know like 12 minute versions of nine minute songs you know like moody blah 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 and then like the encore was like 10 of the greatest songs you've ever heard you're like, like i mean that's what I love about them is that even from night to night, like the experience you might go and see, like if you go and see Hamilton on a Tuesday night and you go and see Hamilton on a Wednesday night, it same is thing. essentially the same show. But if you go and see The Cure on Tuesday night and go and see them on Wednesday night, it could be a completely different show, which again, that's that radio head vibe, right? Like that, I saw them four nights in a row at Madison Square Gardens and the, it, it was great because like it was different songs every night, different order yeah. every night. The, the way that they would go in and out of, you know, different songs gave you something to think about. But obviously Plain Song, which is the first song off this album, off Disintegration, I think probably, and I don't, real Cure fans would know this, but would be the song probably I've seen the most in the same spot. Like a lot of the time they seem to open with Plain Song, like, you know, when they when they play live. Mm-hmm. And that's almost the only regular thing that you could lock in. They're not all the time. Like I've seen them heaps of time when they haven't, but it seems to be like quite a regular thing for them to open with. I like that. See, I also dislike that because there's, there's times where I'm only going to see a band. Like I went to go see My Morning Jacket in Queens and they're playing two nights at this like tennis uh, stadium. And I saw the first night and there were there were a few songs that I really wanted to see and they didn't play because they were saving it for the next night. And like uh, Adam wrote and which is true, Pearl Jam, I seen them two nights back to back. They keep they keep changing their set Radiohead. That was the thing that I hated about Beck because I loved Beck, man. And I had seen one show where he just I saw it again. I've seen it twice because I saw it just a few months ago here in New York City at Irving Plaza. He did an acoustic thing with the two other guys. He played super rare shit, even asked the audience what they wanted to hear. And I saw that in like 2012 in Santa Cruz. And then I went to see him at least 12 more times in the next few years after that because me and my buddy loved him and it became the same fucking set open with devil's haircut, go into black tambourine, go into this shit. And it was just, it got so, I said to him, I'm never going back. 
because I don't want to keep seeing the same songs. The set list bores me now. That's entertaining. I think, yeah. So that's what I think, like, you know, bands like this, they're probably, and this is what I quite like, which is they have decided because the most commercial thing to do, right? Like you don't go and see U2 and they don't sing, you know, where the streets have no name or whatever. Like these sort of bands know what they're doing, what people are buying a ticket for, right? They come mm -hmm. in to see these songs and they want to satisfy their audience. But then there's another type of band that says, who I care about the most is, I'm going to make an experience that if somebody comes and sees three of these shows, they're going to have a better time than one person who might just come and see one of the yeah, shows. Yeah. And to me, that's just actually saying, like, as an artist, I'm going to lean into, like, making something for the people who love it the most, even if that's at the expense of somebody who comes along and goes, oh, I went to see The Cure and they didn't play Pride Home in Love and I'm never yeah. going back or whatever. Like, instead... Yeah you've got their hardcore fans who've supported them for so long. We're like, oh, no, this is brilliant. Look at this. I went three nights in a row. I saw three different shows. It was amazing. Yeah. You know what? I, but hearing that perspective on it, uh, dude, that's because it's, it's kind of like you're a part of a cool club when you really, really love a band. You know, it really is. Like when you, and then occasionally you'll see the same people and you become friends. That's why I like the fish heads and the Grateful Dead people love that scene so much because right. they're going from city to city. They keep saying the same people. They start partying with them. And next thing you know, you're helping each other out, getting to shows. I mean, it's this. Yeah, dude. Um, if, you, if you're playing your same set, like, dude, it's the same shit with comedy, man. If you see somebody doing the same set every that's so boring. Right? Right. But also, I think that you can learn something different about a joke, like in what we do, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you if you do a joke in a different spot in the show, right? Like For um, sure. you can learn something or if it comes in with a different energy or, you know, just context is so important in comedy. So like sometimes you got this like really harsh bit, right? Like if you jam it between two less harsh bits, it works better. What if you just start with your harsh bit, you learn something about how to do the bit, right? I think with music, it is very much the same. Like where the song is in the context of the show can change the entire meaning of the song in that yeah. time or, or and i think that's one of the brilliant things about this album is that you know it, it's often referred to as being this sort of dark moody you know the cure that's what people think about this album if they aren't really familiar with this album but in between it there are you know i mean like yeah love song is a beautiful love song right like it is a beautiful catchy love song like dressed up as something else but it is that right mm -hmm. um fascination street is one of the greatest banger songs of all time like it is <laughs> like a big epic poppy you know it's got momentum like i mean there's stuff in here that is fun along the way if it was just sort of like from start to finish you know sort of depressing and hopeless and those sort of things this would not work as an album yeah looking at the look, looking at the track listing of it I, I do love the way you open it with plain song i mean that's that's a, such a great song dude i'm telling you this he they they want they were like let's run an album for people that are really sad or people that are really in love or uh, people that are fucking <laughs> like if we can just we can make sure we can hit those three markets we should make a masterpiece well, it, that will be our masterpiece <laughs> And well, and Love Song allegedly, although Robert Smith has often said that he lies to the press when he's bored, so you can never entirely you know, believe what he said about his own songs. But Love Song was allegedly written as a love song for his wife, like their childhood sweethearts. They're one of rock and roll's sort of greatest, you know, couplings in a way, because they met when they were like 14, and I think they're still together today. Uh -oh. and, um, but I think part of that is why he's like songwriting emotional maturity is that of a 14 year old kid. Like he thinks of love and falling in love, like a 14 year old kid thinks of love and falling in love. And I think that like, I mean, cause I think in any other circumstance, if you wrote love song and went, Hey, I wrote this for our wedding, <laughs> happy wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the other person would be like, you know what, maybe we should just actually put off this wedding for a while. Yeah, let's, a little, let's take a break. But, but yeah, I think that there is like, there's a lot of love in this, but it's just like, it feels like there's also a lot of emotion and a lot of tortured artists coming up to 30 in it as well.
Yeah. I found this. Uh, well, Adam found it and I'm going to read it. Uh, God bless you, Adam. Adam. You know, it's funny. The whole time we've been doing this, Adam's got like, like two, like four year olds running below him. He's babysitting and he's, <laughs> he's producing the podcast at the same time. Uh, Adam found that uh, Robert Smith said uh, that this song love song is the weakest song on the album and expressed disappointment that it was the band's breakthrough single in the U S I wonder why you would think that. What do you think? Because he's Robert because Smith. yeah, because he's Robert Smith. That is exactly why that he can't be happy. He can't accept his success. He's playing 50,000 people in a stadium and he's like, nah, I just didn't want it to be this popular. He's like, I wrote this song for my wife and the wedding and it's our biggest hit in America. <sighs> I mean, it's on brand. Yeah, it's on brand for a goss just to be miserable about any success, right? Like it was probably maybe he was wrapped, but he was just like, I can't be out there high-fiving people and going, how good is this? <laughs> it's just I, I here's here's the thing. Let's talk about fame for a second. Like I I if you're gonna go into art, you almost have to assume that it's got you want people to hear it you want people to to love you like i i just don't understand like these rock stars and you know like i get it kurt cobain and i'm not trying to because he's the most extreme situation of how to deal with it but it's like you know you're so what you're popular like just you can you don't have to do interviews you can just make the music put it up and play the big shows i don't understand why that would depress you well i i don't think i always think there's been a level of playfulness around that from robert smith i feel like he uses okay. it all i honestly believe he uses it all as a bit of a shield like because here's an interesting thing for a band as big as the curious who've sold as many albums as the curious who still can tour like all over the world to stadiums like that's the size of you know they are one of those bands one of those very few bands in the world who can go to any country in the world and to a stadium still right like that's how big they are wow but but you don't really know anything about robert smith right like normally, you know everything about Dave Grohl. You know most things about Chris Martin. You know everything about Bono. But what do you know yeah. about Robert Smith? Nothing really, right? Like I think that he's often used the look and the vibe and whatever as a shield. Like it is actually to keep his privacy. Like I, I even think the hair and the makeup, because the greatest way to be in disguise is to have an onstage persona. Like I imagine he could, you know, I mean, I don't think he ever probably does, but he could tie his hair up in a man butt, you know, and pop down the shops and nobody would ever know it was Robert Smith. You know, like he... If he's not wearing that, yeah, he just looks like a regular bloke. Like, you'd have no idea. Yeah, especially where... Yeah. But, but if he's wearing a long T-shirt and bicycle yeah. shorts, <laughs> then you'd be like, all right, dude, there's no bikes. <laughs> that outfit is tragic. God bless his soul. Yeah. I get it. I get it. And I think there that maybe that is why the there's a legend almost of the cure and they're this band that people, you know, much like yourself, hold them up to this, you know, important. It's it's like regardless of the rest of the ecosystem and people in the world don't really appreciate or even understand this music, like and they were never as popular as like Drake on a global, global, global scale. It's like they still have this die hard. Do you think it's the music or it's just their, their love of that dark culture? Like it, it, do you know what I mean? Like there's bands like Bauhaus and there's bands like those, those goth bands that they're the people that love them are obsessed with them. Is it the music or is it the fucking look? It's all of it. I think it's a, an experience, but no, I think the music stands alone. I mean, I, I don't think like if you talk, talk just like straight ahead banger songs that you could play at a concert in a row they could go toe to toe with any band in the world. Like there's not like in depth of catalog, you know, there, there are a few bands in the world. If you like into this sort of music where you just go, you could play, you know, 40 songs a night. And these are all songs that I would know. I remember going to see um, uh, Bon Jovi with a friend and I had just not grown up liking Bon Jovi. It wasn't my style of music. Right. And yeah. I remember going to that gig and just being amazed that I knew every single song. You know, because they had just been so much in the zeitgeist. I was like, oh, I didn't realize how much Bon Jovi music that I actually knew. Yeah. I had a great night because I was like, I know all these songs, even though I've never owned a Bon Jovi album. I think if you went to a Cure concert, you would be surprised that you say the same thing. You would just be like, oh, actually, I absolutely yeah. know third. I know 30 of these songs, even though I yeah. didn't think that I was really aware of the Cure. Now that I'm hearing them all in a row, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, this is a great song. God, I never thought of it like that. No, you're right. 
you're right. I love when I'm like, I love when you you go to a concert and you're just like, yeah, I've, like I know, like, dude, I hate to, I'm just for some reason, Smash Mouth popped into my head, but I remember that. Well, Smash I mean, because Mouth- we're talking about the greats, you know? yeah. so <laughs> the greats, the greats. Well, I saw I saw Sugar Ray and yeah. Smash Mouth at some weird yeah. concert. How'd they, like, how'd they get them both together? Was, I know, dude. <laughs> Can you imagine what the writer for that was like? <laughs> you know, the um. But they were playing at my sister's, like, you know, college fucking, yeah. you know, it's fucking May Fiesta. And they get two bands and, you know, they they got they got two bands at the at the at their peak, at their yeah. peak of artistic creativity. And let me tell you something. I knew almost every song and I've never had any of the records. <laughs> and it's fun. It's fun when you're yeah. like, holy shit. Every morning there's a halo <laughs> hanging from the corner. Oh I know all the words, too. How is that possible? Right. Yeah, I know. Um, God, this has been fun, man. I, I got to here. Let's wrap this up. I got to get you. I don't even know what you have to do. What do you have to do? What are you doing the rest of the day? I uh, actually, so this is my, uh, I haven't done gigs for eight months. And yeah. so I've just been in Adelaide at the Adelaide Fringe. So I've done 10 shows in the last sort of eight days, which has been amazing because the yeah. first 10 shows I've done in, you know, so long. And so I've got one more tonight and then I'm done. So yeah, no, wait, so my wait. final show tonight. How, when was the last time you did before this? I didn't catch that. Uh, eight months. So yeah, it was uh, June, June, 2021. So like I hadn't mm-hmm. been on stage since June, 2021. Not to, not to bring up COVID the big C, but is, is it like, is Australia just like super locked down? Is it just like, I feel like you guys took it way more seriously than America did. Yeah. I mean, look at the start. Yeah, definitely. Because I mean, well, firstly, we did what we always do, which was just put up the borders. We're an island and we like to shut up the people out. We're just like, y'all go, fuck off, motherfuckers. It's it's our first solution in any situation. It's like, shut the borders. We're an island. (laughs) We're good, Uh, everybody. We're good. Um, And then, yeah, I think we shut down for a while because I think that, I mean, look, we have a socialized medicine system in Australia and like we prioritize, like, I think, you know, healthcare and stuff a little bit more than America does. I sure. think that's a controversial thing to say, right? And and so it, that was certainly our attitude with COVID as well. I mean, there's only been two and a half thousand people uh, die in Australia from COVID. So yeah, you guys are kicking it, ass. So we were locked down a bit longer than in other places, but not as many people died. So, but we're, it, life's pretty much back to normal now. Like, you know, people are out and about and doing things and coming to shows and living life pretty much as normal. So good. with some precautions. So it's, yeah, it's good. It's good to be back. So let me ask you this for, for taking eight months off someone that is like a lifer and is, and you're just known for being on stage and writing and creating. I mean, like, have you seen a change in your, your actor, like just even your, your energy is, is, is there something different about you coming out of that? Yeah, I think so. I think it's really, really honest at the moment because I yeah, don't yeah. know, I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Like, you know, like I, I can't like, you know, that almost that certainty and confidence of before, you know, like, you know, so much co- comedy is like, I hate this or I love this. Like I am certain about this opinion that I have. Whereas like yeah. now certainty feels so ridiculous, right? Certainty has gone forever. Like, you know, like when people try to make plans with me at the moment, I'm like, yeah, great. Let's say that we're making those plans, but let's not <laughs> pretend that we know that we can actually do those things. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't make plans for something that was happening in my own house later that day, really with a lot of certainty in the world that we live in now. So yeah. <laughs> I, just being in that moment of like confusion and not understanding and like, I'm 48 years old and like, I've just been talking a lot about that idea of like, I went 46 years of my life, never really having gone through anything big. Right. You know, like, like, you know, like I just didn't expect that this was coming along. So I've been really trying to explore that idea of just like being in the confusion and being in like, you know, how you really fucking feel. And yeah. it's been great. Yeah. I've loved it. I've loved being back. I've loved doing the shows. I've just loved being on stage and exploring ideas and stuff. And yes, you, f- you forget that you make yourself laugh. That's the thing that you forget. Like the audience, of course, you remember what that is like. Because I always say that like comedy without an audience is like surfing without a notion, right? Like, yeah. you know, Kelly Slade is a good surfer, but if he's got no ocean, he's <laughs> just like- The waves, he got nothing. Yeah, yeah he's yeah, just yeah. a dickhead on a piece of wood hanging in tent. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like who's, who's that knob? Like, you know? <laughs> you know you need the ocean to be able to do it but what you forget is those moments when like something comes out of your mouth that like almost bypassed your brain 
you know, like your brain didn't acknowledge it and you've said it before you've thought it. And then mm-hmm. you hear those words come out of your own mouth and, and you, you lose your you shit. Yeah. Of laugh. And, and you like, you have to explain to the audience. You're just like, you might, that's the first time I've heard it too. And that yeah, is yeah, good yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, it's the <laughs> best. It's just, it's way more, dude, it's way more fun. I'm not going to lie. It's just like, if you, if you don't come out of, of COVID as a stand up comic, you know, because actors could still act, musicians could still write comics. We could write, but we had no one to say it to. And, and, and so if you can't get back up on stage and, and have like just a love and a gratitude, every set could, I always like, look at now it's like every set could be my last. You never right. know what the fuck's going to happen. And it could get taken away again for, for fucking a year and a half or however long I went before I actually got to do a set. So that's exactly my attitude It's like, literally it's like, it's, I, I remember sometimes we make the mistake as performers of blaming the audience that came, you know, like you oh, get yeah. out there and you're audi- you know, then they're not exactly what you wanted or the room isn't as full as you wanted it to be or something else has gone wrong and you take it out on the people who came. Right. And that is the worst because actually you're angry at the people who didn't go. Right. But yeah. the people who came, they're the good people. They're the ones mm-hmm. you should be entertaining or you're worried that your ticket sales like you won't sell tomorrow night. If I don't do a good show tonight, I won't get ticket sales tomorrow night. That world's gone. Yeah. Like they're here tonight. Like this could be it. Mm-hmm. This could be the last time that you like, they could shut it all down again tomorrow. So this is it. Like the show that you were doing right now for these people, this is all that's important. This is all that exists right now. Like mm-hmm. let's do this shit. And that's how I feel. I'm like really vibed about that. Dude, that's, I'm stoked for you, man. Like, I, you know, hopefully we get to do a festival together or something. I mean, it's, you guys can leave, right? You're allowed to leave yeah, yeah. Australia. Okay, good. I, I don't know. I don't know if we can get back <laughs> in, but we can. We okay. Can yeah. Play. All right. Well, fuck it, dude. You come, come. <laughs> I'm just hoping we do Montreal again together. That's, that's all I care about, yeah. man. I just want a fucking party. All right. Let's do some rapid fires and we'll get you yes. out of here, dude. This was, this was, dude, Emily, this guys, can we just take a second? Yeah. Emily, Emily, you killed it. God bless your soul. Em. Dude, she's going to love this, dude. I fucking love you, Emily. All right. What's your favorite song on this record? Um, uh, probably Fascination Street. I think Fascination so. I think, Street. I just think like that intro is just so epic. And I just think it's the one that's probably, you know, sung sung the most you know like i mean it's really probably the one in the style that i still enjoy the most which is like when robert smith really starts to like open up his lungs and sing like you know and fascination street is just always a great live song it was pictures of you probably and love song when i was like when i first got the album because i was like that emotional kid but i think as an adult probably I love Lullaby. Lullaby is such an iconically cure song to me. Like, you know, very, you know, if I think when people think of Robert Smith, they think of him singing of spiders and Spider-Man and all that sort of like, like I think Lullaby is like almost like if you were going to parody the cure by going, here's like a funny song we wrote in the style of the cure. It, it would sound like Lullaby. I think it's an, an amazing song really, but, um, but no, nah, Fascination Street's probably my favorite. Least favorite song on this record? Um, interesting. Um, the, the final track is called Untitled. And th- there's a bit of a, like, I think people have said that it's untitled because it's so depressing that even Robert Smith couldn't title it. <laughs> and I think that that's probably pretty fair. I, I think that, like, for me... Like what I tend to do, honestly, and I know like the hardcore Cure fans will be offended by this, but if I put this album on, I tend to make it six or eight tracks deep and then I tend to turn it off. Like for me, it just starts so strongly. Like, you know, playing song at the start and then like just to me, those like first six songs in particular are like just iconic, epic, amazing tracks. The next two songs afterwards, like still really really love and then after that just like the tail end by the time it gets the disintegration and onwards still great cure songs but like for me this is definitely like a first half album that i really yeah it's top it's definitely top heavy where the most interesting songs are up top for sure and then the rest of the back the backlog is just like it's moody fucking slower they all kind of blend into one another in a weird way 
Um, yeah, I agree. I, I definitely listened to the first half of the record way more. Um, what song? Now I did the whole record. What song on this record would you fuck to? You guys start it with this one. What do you fucking do? Mm, or what have uh, you fucked to? Good. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't think I don't think this is my mood for for that sort of activity. I think really, I, yeah. Why? How you, uh, dude? This is it's slow, it's moody, it's sexy. What do you yeah, fucking no, I, do? I know what you're saying, but this is not. I don't. I just feel like for me, there's a little bit too much. Um, I don't know. Like, what could I? Without revealing too much about myself, I think that it would take me to different places. You know what? Like it still takes me back to you know a fifteen-year-old girl, and I'm now a you know forty-eight-year-old man. I can't be thinking about a fifteen-year-old girl. Sure, of course, of course. <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, you can't. I, you seriously? There's no way you could. There's no way if you were about to have sex with a girl and your and your fucking iTunes was on shuffle. And suddenly this came on, you would have to stop the sex to be like, I got to turn this yeah, off. This is I'm bringing so, up. I'm so really? sorry, but if this is on and people have heard my podcast with Josh, the authorities are going to be called. <laughs> I mean, like, he's, he's got it on. I don't know what's going on in there. Um, I, I, I think that, no, I would say Fascination Street though, again, though, like, I think it's like, it's got that, that vibe. It's got that yeah. energy to it. I, I think that would be the one. And then I, and then the final question, but I feel like we've answered, but I'm just going to ask it again. Um, do you think this deserves to be, cause this actually moved up yeah. in the 500 greatest albums list. Am I right, Adam? I think this went, let me find the fact that he wrote. This went from, so there on the, on the 2020, no, there's on the 2012 list. What number is this, Adam? On the 2012 list, this is 326, but it jumped up 210 spots. 116 on the 20. Yeah, so this moved into almost the top 100. Do you do you think cuz oh, this is a better question. Mm. Do you think this record and I don't I know I don't know what the other 500 records are, but do you think this deserves to be where we are right now in the are we in the 300s? 326. Uh, do you think it deserves to be at 326 or do you think it deserves to be at 116? Well, I think the reason that it's 116 is that people now acknowledge how huge and a band the cure are right mm -hmm. like it is what i was saying before like here's what i would say i don't know where this album falls maybe like higher than the episode we're doing it now but maybe not as high as like 116 because i don't think it is a perfect album but i think the reason it's moved up so much is because the cure are such a you know huge band with such a huge catalog that they need to recognize that some way in these mm -hmm. sort of lists so they go well what is the album that we can you know put our push behind to go the cure is a good band i think if you went who are the 50 greatest songwriters of all time i think robert smith would there'd be great arguments that he's on that list is this really? album in the top 150 albums i'm not sure it, i'm not sure that i, I like sure that, that he, yeah no that makes know? sense you know that makes perfect sense yeah it's like i i feel like the discussion is more just about if you look at the full catalog of this dude mm -hmm. It's, in, it's yeah, impressive. I, and this is the record. I think, that, yeah, that's why they've moved the album up, right? Because he has such a great all-time career. He has 40 or 50 fucking, you know, all-time great songs. You've got to, you can't leave him off the list. But unfortunately, and I, I think even unfortunately for him, like people say that this is their masterpiece, but this isn't, it, it isn't quite, in my opinion. It's, I think his career is their masterpiece. And I don't think that you need to have an individual masterpiece. I think that the collection of everything you can do can be your masterpiece. And I think also with The Cure, there's two ways to judge that band. They've given their fans everything. B-sides, long versions, different versions, like album after album, single after single. So if you're a completist, if you're only into The Cure, you've got every bit of stuff that you need. But for everybody else, we don't need to be that. Even a Cure fan like me, I probably know off by heart 60, 70 Cure songs, but there'd be Cure fans who know 180. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, you, you can kind of dive in at whatever level that you need to dive in. And I think that that, that career needs to be recognized. This album is their best album probably. And it deserve a, des deserves a place on the list somewhere, of course. Well said, perfect way to end this. Uh, promote away, dude. Anything you want to promote? Um, uh, look, I have a bunch of podcasts and you can find them all at tofop.com, T-O-F-O-P.com and all my touring dates are at willanderson.com, mostly in Australia at the moment, but hopefully get overseas again at some stage. You will. You will. Dude, this was great. Thank you, brother. Thank you, my friend.